Okay, hi everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me all the way in the back. So my name is Henrik, I'm the moderator for these sessions. So we'll get started here in just a second. Just want to remind you, uh, once the session concludes, we'll have a microphone here in the middle for questions. So please line up and ask any questions you might have. I'll try and get a couple of questions from the, uh, the virtual meeting room as well. Make sure those guys are included. Um, and after the session, please don't forget to, to rate the session. And if you have additional questions after the session concludes and we're out of time, please continue those discussions out in the hall so we can clear the room and prepare for the next session. And with that, I'm gonna leave it over to you. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Can you give me a thumbs up if I'm perfectly audible? Great. Okay, so this is the title of our talk. It was originally, the subtitle was the title of our talk, but our uh, PR person about had an aneurysm when they saw that I was um, submitting that talk. But I explained to her, first of all, everybody, at least all of our customers, know we had an outage. And second of all, everybody has outages. It's not news when a, a SaaS provider has an outage. So we wanted to come here and share our experience with the community to maybe help you avoid an outage or deal with it um, when it comes up. So uh, my name's Rick. I'm currently the VP of product at Influx Data. At the time of this incident, I was the VP of engineering for the platform team. So I was there during the, the day that we um, deleted and restored one of our production environments. And hi, my name is Wojciech. I am a platform engineer at the deployments team at Influx Data. And I've been involved in many, in many parts of the incidents and follow-ups, including post-mortem and fixes around what broke and how we make sure that it doesn't happen again. Okay, so who are we? Why are we using Kubernetes? Why might our experience be relevant? So at Influx Data, we view ourselves as a development platform for writing time series applications. We don't really view ourselves as a Kubernetes tools vendor. That said, a lot of our customers use us to monitor their Kubernetes clusters. And then we have different companies that have actually built SaaS solutions for monitoring Kubernetes on top of us. So while we are an application development platform for time series, at the heart is a database called InfluxDB. It's an open source database that's purpose built for time series. But currently our flagship product is called InfluxDB Cloud. And this is a multi-tenant SaaS solution. It's built on top of Kubernetes. And the reason it's built on top of Kubernetes is because we offer it on the top three clouds and multiple regions in all those clouds. So I think we have like 12 or 15 production instances running around the world right now that we manage. And Kubernetes provided that cloud abstraction layer that we needed to be able to manage the same application in all of those different regions and clouds. Right, so the timeline, which is basically how to delete your production in a few easy steps. So let's, as Rick mentioned, InfectDB Cloud is a flagship product. It's a stateful Kubernetes-based application, and we use GitOps and CI/CD to keep it running and keep it up to date. Uh, we have multiple uh, tiers uh, in the application. Some of them are stateful. Most of them are stateless. So one of the key things that we have is the storage tier that's using PVCs and, uh, and keeps data in, in, in Kubernetes native volumes. Also using cloud native objects so like S3 for long-term persistence. But the key is that it's keeping the data so it can be queryable, readable, writable really fast on disk. Then we use Kafka and Zookeeper for write-ahead log, meaning as soon as we get a request to add new data, it goes into Kafka. And then storage tier processes that as soon as possible. At the time of the incident, we used etcd for all of the metadata that we had. So things like bucket names, which is where we put the data, organizations, users, so all of the all of the metadata for the application. Right now, moving away from that, from that for Postgres for various reasons, but at the time it was at C. And like I said, we have multiple stateless microservices. So when you run a query against InfluxDB, it goes to our query engine, which is entirely stateless. It parses the query, it sends the commands to proper storage tier pods by knowing which shards to ask for the specific data, gets it back, reconstructs it, returns the data. And most of our, most of our components are 
are stateless. And we use Argo CD for deploying all of our instances of InfluxDB Cloud. So we have, as Brick mentioned, 12 to 15 production ones. We have multiple staging or testing ones. And we use GitOps to manage all of them. We use CI CD to get everything built as soon as the code changes and see obviously to deploy them. We use Argo CD's feature of Arc Auto Sync, which means that as soon as something shows up in our GitOps config repository, it gets deployed. And we also use prone, which means if something was in that repository and it's no longer there, it'll get deleted. And I think you know where this is going. And now we use something called the app of apps pattern, which means we use Argo CD to configure how and where Argo CD deploys its things, which is also important. So how it all started, I'm suspecting this may be a bit out of focus, but that's actually by design. So this PR was merged, and this is basically just adding new data. There's like 500 new lines, most of it generated YAML files. It did not remove any single thing, but as soon as it got merged within minutes, we deleted all of our, uh, our entire single production environment. Um, so I'll show what happened, it's still out of focus, but that's also by design. So what happened is we use our code name IDP for the productions of the thing we want to keep running in all, each of our clusters. And we also have an open source project called IOX that we wanted to deploy alongside. But what happened, but you may not even see it because it's a tiny detail, is that we had a naming collision. So, it, so the IOX was deployed as IDP, and you can see that the first arrow points that it should be IOX and it's IDP. I'll show it again in a bit in a better picture. The point of this is it was really difficult to spot in code review, same as it may be difficult to spot for you now. So what we wanted to, how, here's how Argo CD works and what we wanted to get to. So on the left side, we have the apps of apps pattern just for one cluster. We have that for all of our clusters, but just for one of it, what we had initially was our IDP, so our production environment, and that was an Argo CD. Argo CD has its custom resource called application that defines, that has a name, defines the locations of the Git repository to, to get the definitions from, and then where it should be deployed to, and also the path in that Git repository. So then that repository specifies like a namespace and defines all the, all the deployment stateful sets, anything else that we want deployed as part of that application. And then what we wanted to do is wanted to add IOX alongside. So we added a new Argo CD application. We, uh, or we wanted to add a new Argo CD application. We wanted that to the point to a different path in the repository that would have all the objects for IOX. But what really happened is because we had a typo and it was IDP and now it's on the left side in the middle in red, because it was IDP instead of IOX, which is what we wanted, Argo CD went in and said, okay, I have two definitions for the IDP CD uh, application. So I'm going to take the next, so I'm going to apply the last one, which was actually pointing to the wrong Git repository. So then Argo CD applied that, and in, then the actual Argo CD deployment for that application decided, okay, I no longer have IDP to deploy, and I should be pruning everything. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete the whole, the whole production cluster and deploy this IOX testing environment instead. So, and this is a snippet from our, from our uh, status page for the incident once we had the post-mortem in place. This was exactly what happened. Due to some mistakes when we were adding the IOX, we should have put IOX CD, AWS Pro 01, US Central 1. Instead, we added IDP, and this way, we managed to basically <laughs> delete the whole thing, and this is where the incident began. Okay, so I woke up at seven in the morning. I, <laughs> I live on the East Coast, and I don't, for anyone here who manages a, a SaaS environment, you know that you never stop thinking about it, and the first thing you check in the morning is like what happened at night. And so this is uh, what I woke up to. Uh, good times. This, by the way, if you're trying to quit coffee, this will help you wake up without coffee. <laughs> So I just went straight to my computer um, and just started working on this. So um, this is the first part. This is when the damage was done. This is actually all like right before I got up. So the PR, these are all times that are UTC, but I'm based on the East Coast. So um, the PR was merged and then all our monitoring systems started to report API failures. 
but we had a bit of monitoring fatigue at the time. So we told it like, look, you really need to wait a while before you start paging people because like these bothering our, our staff with these transient API failures is uh, just annoying people and it's not helping much. But then a customer called in and then another customer and said, hey, it seems like something's not working. So the support team jumped in and uh, said, uh, customers are reporting a problem. And we looked around and sure enough, all the alerts started firing at that point and it was clear there was uh, something wrong. So in our culture, when we deliver code that causes a problem, we just revert it immediately. And we, we really try to develop so that a revert of code is the, um, path back to stability. But this was not a code change, this was an infrastructure change. So the developer actually followed that process, submitted the PR, but then the team realized that like just reverting a change like that, since it was an infrastructure change, is probably not the way to do it. But fortunately, we also have a culture of anyone being able to stop the line. So we stopped all synchronizations. We have this thing that we call internally the big red button. Anyone can press it and it'll just stop deployments through all of our um, deployment environments. Um, then the engineering team said, okay, we really need to start really planning a proper recovery process. And by the way, did anybody update the status page? And we um, updated the status page to alert customers. And then they started calling everybody like, hey, this is all hands on deck. Uh, uh, you know, when they really, the penny dropped about the severity of the problem. Okay. so. Uh, here I don't have individual times because this phase really um, unfolded over the course of uh, hours. But the first thing the team did was to create a deployment checklist and, and double check that list. And that, I was really impressed with that. Everyone stayed very calm and uh, instead of, you know, panicking, they say, okay, like, let's make a plan, but like, let's double check the plan before we start stampeding and to make sure that we don't make things worse. And I actually credit the uh, short time that it took us to rebuild the production environment to that systematic uh, mentality that the developers followed. So then we went through and we started to redeploy services carefully and in the proper order. And the main thing was to connect when we could the stateful services to their persistent volumes because that saved us a lot of time in terms of not having to play back backup data, right? So the data was there, we could um, just reconnect it and start using it. Then um, additional services, especially the, state, stateful, the stateless ones were redeployed in parallel with people going and making sure like, did we actually recover the volumes properly, like is the data actually safe and proper? And it turned out it, it was. Um, we had some services that we just recovered from Valero backups. Um, if the team thought, you know, okay, the best strategy is just to get that from Valero. But then also we were like, you know what, when we turn this back on, everybody's telegraph instances, like the, some of the, eight, we, we have an agent that people can use to write to InfluxDB, those are all gonna start writing, everybody's queries are going to start stampeding us, everyone's going to be trying to catch up. So we scaled out, especially the ingress tier, but also, also other tiers, anticipating that surge in traffic when we came back on. Um, and then finally, the smoke started to clear. We enabled the right service and then let, started accepting people's rights and spent some time to verify that that was all working and that we hadn't lost any data. And then we realized that we had, we we're gonna have another problem if we weren't careful. InfluxDB has something called a task system, which means if you have a script that is uh, down sampling data or like importing data from another data source and joining with time series data or exporting to another data source, doing some kind of custom calculation, and that's happening on a schedule, you can push all that work down into our platform. And some people run those every second, every minute, every hour, and we realized when the task system comes back on, it's gonna realize it wasn't running tasks for the past few hours. It's gonna try to run all those tasks, and if 
it's trying to run all those tasks and users are trying to run queries at the same time, it's just going to be a complete collision, uh, you know, just a total traffic jam of queries. So what we decided to do was before we turned on queries again, we just let the task system run its course. And fortunately, it wasn't too long. So we let all those tasks um, run and fail. And then when the backlog was done and the tasks were caught up, we went ahead and turned on the query service. And at that point, really the smoke had cleared and we were back in business. So uh, we alerted all our customers, hey, the, the service is back. We also went through and collected a lot of information for customers, like, hey, here's the ID of all your failed tasks. Here's a script that you can run to rerun them if you want, if they're still relevant, um, and just other things that we could do to help them recover. During the course of the day, I was busy just like writing down and logging what happened. So we were able to write an uh, RCA doc and put it on our status page within an hour or two after the incident so that people could go back and uh, you know, see what really happened. From that, we got an interesting piece of feedback from one of our big customers who said, well, we're just glad it was automation and not somebody sitting in front of the terminal. So uh, they actually, it was a little bit almost confidence building in a way that it wasn't somebody fat fingering at a terminal and it was our, our automation um, uh, going crazy there. So uh, we did, obviously we spent a couple days during internal RCAs. Um, uh, so, one of the things that we found during the RCA process that we ran was that our, our cross-team efforts were really effective, right? So SRE team, deployments team, developers working together. And I really chalked that up to our blameless culture. Um, it was about like what was wrong with our systems. It was never about any, any person. No person made a mistake. Our, our systems were lacking. And that um, I could see really enable that kind of collaboration. Um, while we had downtime, we did not lose any data. And that I mean, if anybody tried to write data while we were down, they got back a 404 or 500 or something, right? What's terrible is that they get back a 204, we got your data, but it didn't actually write the data because <laughs> then they're in an inconsistent state and they don't know like how their application is going to perform. So uh, in this case, they could go back and decide if they wanted to backfill during the time that we were down or how they wanted to handle it. Um, we did uh, avoid panic as, uh, as we mentioned. While we did like immediately sort of knee jerk to that rollback attempt, uh, we were able to stop and create a plan first. Uh, props to Valero. Also props to our SRE team, like the week before they had been practicing Valero backups. So that was like right at their fingertips to uh, how to use Valero to, to get back. Um, some things that we were not so happy about was um, like how did our automation allow this to happen, right? So like CI, CD or like GitOps, it's a, it's a very sharp knife, which they say a sharp knife is the safest, but it cut us deeply uh, in this case. Um, and the other thing was we never anticipated deleting a cluster. So our alerts were tuned to errors in our code or some user doing something that we didn't anticipate, but we never imagined like we'd need to be alerted that the cluster was deleted and we had no run books for recovering the cluster. So uh, we do now because we wrote it over the course of that day. Okay, so in terms of recovering some uh, some like rec recap and maybe some technical information, so as Vic mentioned, our first instinct was to revert the change. Like when you're doing a lot of small code changes and you're in a microservice-based architecture, that's what you often do. You make small changes that aren't breaking, so they're easy to deploy incrementally and easy to roll back. But in this case, it wasn't a good, good idea because we would be creating new volumes instead of reusing the volumes that, that, were, that were retained by, the, by, by Kubernetes and the, and the, and the clouds. Um, so at that point, as we mentioned, the team stopped and we started creating a, a proper plan. And the goal was that we want to restore all the stateful items manually and then recreate the rest via CD with maybe some manual tuning that we will get into in a bit. So what we did, and maybe some questions around that, is like, why didn't we just re redeploy the storage tier? And storage tier is the 
the part of the system that keeps all of the time series data, so all of your metrics for the last n years. Uh, and the reason for that is, if we were to do that and not and not like reattach the volumes that that we had that we still had, uh, we would be we would need to fetch the data from the cloud native objects, so like S3 or Google Store or any other storage system, and replay that data. And that would take several hours. And keep in mind that we were able to recover in just, I believe it was six hours, less than six hours, I think, even. And if we would do that, this would probably roll over into more like 10 or 12 hours. Now, the other question is, uh, maybe I'll, I'll back up and just mention one thing. So most of our volumes in that, in that cluster were defined to be in retain mode, meaning that even if you delete the PVC, the actual per persistent volume and the actual underlying cloud storage volume is kept there. So, but that wasn't the case for everything. So for Zookeeper, that's just keeping the state for Kafka and it doesn't really have any changes. Our topics in Kafka and everything in Kafka is pretty much static. It's just a data in Kafka that changes. So we were able to just restore that from the hourly backups and we, and we decided that for Zookeeper, that's, that's enough to just have the backups in place. For Kafka and etcd, uh, we were able, we, we, since, as I mentioned, we had the persistent volumes, we just restored them. It was initially a manual process. Then once we made sure that it works, we could like script that and just run it. But we have a lot of pods in, in Kafka, etcd, and storage, so it would be painful to do it manually and prone to fat fingering that we didn't want. Once we had that, we could recreate the stateful sets, and then, and then by then, Kubernetes would recreate the pods. With storage, it was pretty much the same thing. The main difference is that uh, the way our storage still works, it just has to index the data at that point. But basically, as soon as it, as every single as, as a storage pod wakes up, it re-indexes the data in the persistent volume in case it was shut down incorrectly, so that have an up-to-date index, and then it can asynchronously inject the the, the write-ahead log data from Kafka. And last question: Why didn't we? just enable everything at once. As Rick mentioned, that there are some tricks to that. So we started enabling parts of Winflex data as they started to work. So even before the storage data was fully restored, we could start enabling writes to the system because, we, because the writes just put the data in Kafka and report 204 if, if the write to Kafka was successful. So people could start writing data even though they were not able to query it yet and it wasn't properly persisted yet, but the Kafka with its availability and replication allowed us to, to be confident with that approach. Once we had all, all the stateful services in place, we deployed the remaining ones, we increased the number of replicas. And again, in terms of what was enabled or what was running, we started with tasks, we let all the tasks run, we made sure that the backlog was empty. And then after that happened, we enabled queries. And at that point, we were confident to just roll, scale back and configure the number of replicas to what it is on a day-to-day -day basis or what it should be. Right, so now, after we've done that, the obvious question is, can we not delete production again, please? Because it, it, it took a lot of people a lot of time and everyone was had to stop whatever they were doing at the time, or maybe like use the text message instead of coffee for waking up. So the first thing is, like obviously we don't want that thing to be merged again. And just a quick introduction to how we do things. We use JSONnet, which is a tool that allows rendering multiple, well, objects basically, it's not Kubernetes specific, but we use it for Kubernetes objects. Prior to the incident, we were just writing everything to a single YAML file. So the PR you've seen was, the, was just a big YAML file that had object with the, same, with the same name and namespace added to it. So that was the problem. We moved that to have, so to have a single object in a single file, and the file name is generated from object properties. So it's the API version, it's the kind, so like a service, deployment, stateful set, etc. Namespace, or if this, if this, is, a, if, or if this, isn't a, if this is not a namespaced object, then I think we use a static string there. Then the name, uh, and, and that would prevent it, because at, at that point, that PR would show that we're overwriting an object in YAML at the, at the YAML level and not adding one. But we went a bit further than that because as we include API version in Kubernetes, you could have like v1, beta1, and v1, and that technically would be a separate file, but at the Kubernetes level would, would, would generate, would, would override the object anyway. So we use a tool called kubeconfig to generate YAML from JSONnet, and we've added a smarter logic to, to detect those collisions in there. And basically, it's going to refuse to generate the YAML files if, if you have a collision in there. And I think that. The big upside from that is now when we review PRs, 
we see which object gets changed because sometimes when you have a complex deployment state full set and you just want to add a variable, another container or something, it wasn't really clear what you were editing and you had to scroll up or down a lot. So now it's, now it's more efficient in a lot of other things. And then we looked at, can we do something at Argo CD level? Argo CD is a great tool, but you want to configure some of the things to make it even better and like make it even safer to use it. Uh, because of all the automation in place, it's really easy to, 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 to do something really bad when you, when you, when you make, make a mistake. So Argo CD has annotations that you can add to, to objects, to basically any Kubernetes object. And one of them is prone equals false, I believe that's the annotation. Uh, I mean, that the value for the annotation, which will mean Argo CD will never delete the underlying object. So if you add it to your stateful set, I don't remember the annotation name. Uh, even if you delete it in your YAML files or whatever Argo CD is getting the object definitions from, Argo CD will just leave it alone and will just no longer manage it. One thing we learned as well, and I think this is a valuable lesson, you need to set it for namespace as well, because in one of our first drills and of testing the this change, we noticed that actually Argo CD deleted the namespace, Kubernetes deleted all the stateful sets, so it didn't really help without setting it to the namespace level. We also added annotations that make Argo CD refuse to update a resource that already exists and has annotations that specify it's managed by another Argo CD application. So if we, if we would ever accidentally clash at like an object level, so someone else would create a same a stateful, say with stateful set with the same name in the same namespace, Argo CD would just fail to sync, would just report an error, and this would show up in our alerting system immediately. And one last thing that we've done that was based on, on Rick's handling of the, of the incident and, and the team's coordination of that is, well, first thing we decided is we need to basically go back and delete an environment again, just to test everything. But in this case, we deleted a staging, so testing environment, not a production one. We did that after, obviously, after we've written the run books, but this was a way to test them. We also were doing some exercises, fire drills around things like Argo CD. Does, after updating Argo CD version, does the annotation still work? Because at some point, some of the configuration settings changed in Argo CD itself. And we learned a ton of new things about what happens when things go wrong, when we just basically did a, 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 an equivalent of, of, of Chaos Monkey. And I think everyone should think about doing this. Maybe don't start with production, but like testing what happens when your GitOps goes sideways and testing how you can potentially, or thinking about how you can potentially break it and making sure you can't, you can't do that is, is, is a really important thing to think about. We went back and looked at all the volumes across all our environments. So this was a relatively new environment that was done when we had all the automation in place and all of the volumes were set to retain properly. But we went back, looked back at the first environments that were created manually. And I believe in some cases we found some volumes that should be retained but weren't or vice versa. And we went back and, and, and updated all those settings. And one last but very important thing, we looked at our processes and uh, made them more consistent and made them more easy to follow. So this was our first incident that involved a large number of customers that were affected by it. So the first thing we learned is you need to have a way to list all the customers that may be affected by an issue. Then make sure that you have all the valid contact points because sometimes that may be a different person than the login that someone's using, uh, have a consistent way of contacting, have someone leading the, the, the contacting effort and making sure we know when an incident is resolved and that we update, proactively update all the customers about the incident status and that they are updated all the way to it being resolved and that we just don't depend on someone refreshing our influx, status, influx data status page and that being the only way they find out about how things are. And with that, I believe that's it. So if you have any questions, please make your way up to the microphone here in the middle, and we have a few minutes left for, for questions. While you do that, I think I'm going to do one from, from the virtual attendees sure. uh, and see. So I think you touched on this earlier, but uh, someone is asking here, in which cases Valero is a better way to recover the application instead of just uh, redeploying the applications? So I, I think that 
really depends on what data you have and how much time how much time it takes to re recreate it and how accurate the data will be once you do it in each way. So in the case of Zookeeper, that data didn't really change often, so just reusing Valero was fine, because once you have Kafka set up, the data in Valero doesn't really change often. So that was fine. For example, if we were to use hourly backups for data that our customers would be writing, there would be potential of losing the data for the up to last 60 minutes, for example. So I think that's always a case-by-case -case choice. In, in, yeah. So when we were designing which volumes to retain, we chose you not know, to retain Zookeeper. For us, there was about three levels. The first is just like, if it's stateless, Valero doesn't really help. Just let CD redeploy that. If it's stateful and the data has not changed since the last Valero backup, then Valero can really help you out. But if it's stateful and the data is constantly in flux, like it is for us, as people are constantly writing, then you're gonna lose all of the user data between the last Valero backup and where you are right now. And so then just uh, manually deploying and reconnecting to the PVCs was uh, a better option for us during the incident. Okay, great, thank you. So see, we'll see some people lined up at the microphones. We'll switch it over yeah. to room questions here. So uh, I wonder if you wouldn't have stopped the, um, the Git revert, uh, wouldn't it have been okay? I mean, if all the volumes are correctly uh, retained and you uh, revert to the initial state, seems to me like it could have worked, right? Uh, it, I think we, in some cases we may have been missing some objects. I don't really remember at this point. It was, I believe it was like uh, eight months ago. Uh, I think we've made a conscious decision that something may go wrong. So there's a chance things will just work out. The issue is it's always in, that, in those cases when you're risking losing data, I think it's safer to just go with the manual approach. I believe it may have worked, but I, I remember we had to recreate some of the uh, persistent volume objects or something like this. So, I mean, one thing that was just missing in here is we use our own CRD and our own controller to manage the storage tier. We don't use stateful sets for that. And I believe this is one of the places where we may have to, where we may have needed to do something slightly differently. I just don't remember the details right now. But All right. So this was a conscious decision that you made a risk assessment and decided. To yes. yes. Because yes. if we just redeployed, then Argo would have said, "Okay, new storage pods, new PVCs," and then we would have had like to, to had a juggling act on our hands instead of just you know just. Re creating the new pods and attaching. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, did you manage, uh, did you investigate it in your uh, CICD to deploy with Argo to generate all the um, all the, the objects and then run something like kubectl diff to see <laughs> what will be applied and what would change and then review that instead of the code? Right, so when we started designing our CD process. That was one of the discussions we had. Do we want to commit the generated files or have a tool run them and maybe it also generate a diff at the PR level? We chose to explicitly commit because while this isn't the case in most, in most circumstances, but we were worried that the version of JSONnet in Argo CD may differ from the version of JSONnet that our tooling, other tooling may be using. And then you may have those subtle differences that show up when you apply. It's just, it just seems like a safer way to do things. And also, this makes it that this is part of the PR. And in GitHub, you can configure which files are generated. So when you open a PR in GitHub, it doesn't show you the generated files, but you can expand them. But at least you see the number of additions and the number of deletions. So even with just the numbers, you would catch that it's an overwrite. But often when we're touching stateful things, people open the YAML files and read them. It just, just seems more natural and seems safer, and that's what we decided at a company level and in all the CI CD that we do for all the tools that we have, we commit YAML files. Hi. Um, first question, has this incident changed how your organization work? For example, the priority of disaster recovery is actually higher sometimes than feature development? Um, I'm going to say no, because for us, safeguarding the user's data and not losing data is always the top priority for everything that we do. So there's like really no way for us to make it an even 
even higher priority. But we did learn a lot. And because we have that um, as such a high priority, the company was very tolerant to us actually taking the time to do some more investigation and up, apply the learnings. Whereas, you know, maybe other companies, if they're under more feature pressure, they, they may not have had that luxury. So did, did that answer your question? Yes, thank okay. you. I think we have time for one final question. Uh, one say, uh, little question. What was the th first thought you had when you read the text message? <laughs> uh, it finally happened. <laughs> <laughs> And one second question, uh, how did you manage to deploy the different objects while, while you had one si big single file with all the definitions? Did you separate the one file in single like batches to deploy or? Do you mean during the recovery process? Yes. Uh, I can answer that. Yeah. So basically, we, I mean, we, we're proficient with JSON, so there are ways in which you can pick and choose which objects get generated. Uh, it's relatively easy to just generate a subset of the files. At the end of the day, JSON is just an array of objects. I mean, the, the thing that we render at, from those files is an array of objects, and you can just filter on that array of objects and choose the ones you want. But I think just, Jamie did a lot of cube cuddle. That's another thing. I mean, yeah, in the heat of the Or moment, you can just yeah. copy paste, right? I mean, there are yeah. multiple ways to, to get it. It's not like it's a closed system you can get. Like, you can JSON at dash dash eval, and then you can do a lot of things in, in one liners as well. So. This is beyond the scope of this, but it's, it's not difficult. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think that wraps it up. So a big thank you to our presenters. Thanks everyone for coming. If I can please ask you to any, do any additional questions outside the room and don't forget to rate the session afterwards. Thanks everyone. <laughs>